Well, we are in our series, Growing with the Giants, and uh, we're talking about just a, a variety of different people in the Scripture, but we really started out in Genesis because I think that's a good place to start, right? Uh, Genesis means beginnings, so we start in the beginning. And uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in the first uh, four books of Genesis. Matter of fact, this is it, and then we're going to move on towards, uh, towards Joseph and Pharaoh and others and people like that. You know, the record that we have this morning before us is of Cain and Abel. So you can open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, if you would. And as I think about the record of Cain and Abel, it's, uh, it's not a rewarding one. It's, um, it's pretty simple, really. A brother kills his brother because of jealousy. Or maybe there's other components that we'll learn from here. And it may be hard, though, to imagine, how can you learn from a murderer? How can you learn from a killer like Cain? Well, I'm under the impression that if you can't learn from someone's good example, you can learn from their bad one. And so as we look throughout these giants, and as we look throughout their, 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 uh, their good things, and we look throughout their bad things, let's learn what we can, what we can from people who have committed significant sinful acts. And this is one of them. This is the first murder. And we can learn from it. Not how to do it better, but what precipitated it? How is it that, and why is it, that Cain went and he killed his brother? There's some underlying truth here that we can grow this year. Now, growth is our theme. We want to grow in all areas of our life. And we can grow from the themes that we see here. So let me read the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And Adam knew his wife, knew Eve, his wife rather. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. It's a real tragic story. It's a tragic story of what happens when a sinner sins. Let's begin with looking at Cain's trouble. The first thing we want to look at is Cain's trouble. And in many ways, Cain's trouble is similar to our own. Which is interesting. Let me read again verses 3 to 5. And in the process, in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling, the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Verse 3 seems... Genuinely harmless, doesn't it? It seems like here is this guy trying to do a, a, a good deed for the Lord, and he's offering a sacrifice. We just simply see Cain offers his sacrifice in verse 3. In verse 4, his brother, not in necessarily, not in competition, but just offers a sacrifice to the Lord as well. Verse 5 is the turning point for Cain. You see, because Cain's offering was not accepted, but his brother Abel's offering was. Now, this has a, a tremendous 
theological importance, okay? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the theological implication here, but even from this time, and we'll back up all the way to, to Genesis chapter 2, 3 even, we see the, the shedding of blood, which was necessary for the atoning of sin. Remember with me that Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were unashamed. They sinned. Then they knew that they were naked. So they took these fig leaves. They, they made the garment. They covered themselves. But when they went to God, God said it wasn't enough. So there had to be the shedding of blood. So when we get to this implication theologically between Cain and Abel, Cain offered his, his fruit from the ground, and Abel offered his, his fruit from the pasture. There was a shedding of blood. This points to the cross, the cross of Calvary, all the way back from Genesis 2 and 3, and now we have in, in 4. The very first mention of the coming Messiah was back in Genesis chapter 3, which is known as the Proto-Evangelium. The first mention of, 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 uh, of Satan being defeated by Christ. We see it all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. This has tremendous theological implication. And it's very important to understand that when it comes time to talk about atonement. How do we get saved? Do we get saved by our own good deeds? Or do we get saved by someone else's deeds? And, and we'll get into that here in just a moment. But in this case, only a blood sacrifice would do. But Cain's trouble was, uh, was very similar to ours in that uh, he was trying to please God on his own terms. You see, Cain thought maybe that if I just offer the Lord something that I have uh, from my field, that, that, that any offering will do. But it wasn't so. I think a lot of times we fall into the same trouble that Cain did. That we think that, that our offering, that, that we, what we may offer, might be acceptable to the Lord. But did you know that Christianity, that what Christ is asking is exclusive? You see, Christianity is not, is not inclusive, it's exclusive. It's exclusive for only those people that know the way. And we get to Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other, none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It's exclusive. There's one name. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a multitude of names. It's not, well, we can be saved by Buddha and we can be saved by Muhammad. He says we can only be saved by Jesus. I'm so thankful for that, that we have one person to turn to. John 14, 6, Jesus declares this when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Exclusivity. It's exclusive to only those people that place their faith. We see a greater, even a great um, Verse in Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, does this not tell us that we need to really reach people with the gospel? Because there are very few people that find it. Now, we're known as a, a Christian nation, aren't we? We're kind of known as kind of this Christian conglomerate that maybe like, you know, you, you ask uh, 10 people out on the street uh, if they're a Christian or not, and they say, they say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And you say, well, what does that mean to you? I had a discussion with a guy uh, just, uh, what was it, the other day, uh, Friday, actually. And uh, we talked a little bit about the difference between being a Christian and being a disciple. And he was having a, a tough time kind of reconciling the two because he thought every disciple was a Christian, every Christian was a disciple. He used them kind of synonymously and interchangeably. And I said, it's not true. I said, a person can follow the Lord without believing in the person they follow. And a person can believe in someone they're not following. We live in this, in this Christian nation where kind of everybody thinks that all you have to do is mention the name of Jesus and, uh, and you're a Christian and you're a follower. All you have to do is believe in heaven and uh, just the belief in heaven will, will, will somehow make a payment for you and you'll be there when you die. But there's exclusivity there is exclusivity. Narrow is the way. There is one name under heaven, only one name, and that's Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? But we know what that does. That puts a big burden on us, doesn't it? A positive burden that we need to share the gospel message with other people. We need to share this gospel with others that they might come to know Christ as their way to heaven, their only way. 
One commentator said that the trouble with Cain was that he had his own ideas about God and about the way God should be approached and propitiated. How many of us have our own ideas about how we can get to heaven? How many of us have our own ideas about what satisfies God? I think if I were to ask for a raise of hands, how many of you at times have said that I think church membership satisfies God? Or maybe somebody says, well, well, I think giving money to church satisfies God. But there is only one way to satisfy God, only one thing that pleases God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, how do we draw a connection, though, to a growth application? Well, how do we get a growth point out of this? How does this tie into our theme this year of how to grow? What can we learn from this? What can we learn from Cain's trouble that is so similar to our own? Well, first of all, let me say this. I think Cain wanted to be successful. I think he wanted to be successful. Now, it doesn't say in, uh, in, a, in a verse there, it doesn't say in the, in the Hebrew that, that, that Cain wanted to be. I think he did, though, want to be successful. And I think for the most part, we want to be successful in our endeavors in life. I think we want to be successful. I think even a couch potato wants to be successful. They have no ambition, they have no, they have no motivation, no direction, no goal, but I, I, I think they want to be successful. I mean, they, they look at the world, and they, they're, they're a couch potato, and they're watching uh, the, the entertainment there from Hollywood, and, and they say, man, I wish I could be like that. I really want to be successful. But the question isn't, how do we be successful on our own, but how do we ask the Lord what, how he wants us to be successful? How do we go to God, and should we go to God, and say, Lord, on what terms should I approach you? In what way should I please you this year in 2020? How do we grow? Let's not... Let's not grow in our, in, our, in our own ways, but let's grow in the ways of God. How many of us, when we were back in 2019, how many of us in 2019, when we get to November, December, and that, that, that critical moment comes when you have to have your, your New Year's resolution, right? How many of you have actually sat down and prayed this way? Lord, what is it you will have me to do this year? In what way can I please you the most? What areas do I need to grow in, Lord? How can I best be a testimony for your namesake? You know, quite honestly, I think we, we, uh, we, we've, we kind of parrot what the world has done for, for years. And if you smoke, the New Year's resolution, the goal is, is to stop smoking it's applaudable, right? I mean, let's face it. You want to stop smoking. What does God want you to do, though, this year? You know, Cain's trouble was that he was trying to, to reach success based upon what he thought was best, as opposed to asking God, what is best for me? And I think when our goals are not in line with God's goals, we're going to fail every time. Or we're going to get there, and we're going to be there for the wrong reasons. How many of us have done something that was right for the wrong reasons? And how many of us uh, are the opposite of that? You see, when we set out to do our goals, we set out to, to reach our goals, we set out to be the best person that we can be, we need to set out to be the best person we can be for Christ's sake, not our own. We can do all sorts of things that the world and society says, oh, those are good goals. That's, a, that's, a, that's an admirable goal, and that's what you need to do. But the reality is, is that what God wants you to do? Is it what, is it what Cain should have done? Or should, should Cain have, have gone to maybe his brother Abel and said, hey, oh, bro, listen, I mean, I know what's acceptable to God, and, and, and quite honestly, I don't have it. And man, I could, I could just really use, a, uh, I could really use an animal here to sacrifice. He says, no, he says, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to try to be successful my own way. And we need to be careful of that. So we have to be careful of Cain's trouble. We also have to be careful of Cain's temptation. You know, no temptation 
has taken you but such as is common to man. And when I look at Cain's temptation, I have to ask myself, are we susceptible to this? And yes, we are. Cain had a temptation that we were susceptible to, just like Cain's trouble in verses 4 to 6, I'm sorry, 6 to 7 in Genesis 4. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. You see, I believe verse 7 was a second chance. Aren't you just thankful for a second chance? I mean, at this point in time, in, in, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 6 and 7, this is the time that Cain could have gone to Abel and said, hey, I screwed up the first sacrifice, brother. I need help with the second one. You obviously have done something that was, that was right before the Lord, and I have not. I have chosen my own way to try to please God. I have set my own destination for success. You know, I think Cain worked hard to please God. I, I believe that. I believe he worked hard. I don't believe he just went out to the, the field and found something that was, you know, kind of kicked it and said, that'll do. I think Cain worked hard to prepare a sacrifice that was unacceptable. And you know what? Let me tell you what. I believe that sometimes we have goals that God doesn't want us to attain. I think growth is biblical, and I think we ought to grow in every area of our life, but we ought to be asking God, what is it that you want from me this year? How is it best that I can please you, Lord? He had every opportunity to please the Lord. But his work was worthless, wasn't it? In Romans 8, 8, it says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. How many of us have tried to please God in our flesh? How many of us have, have tried the hardest that we can do to do the things that we can without consulting God? You know, what a shame it is that Christians don't consult the one they're trying to please. We need to approach success to please God, not to get the praise of men. Now, I can't tell you exactly why it was that, that Cain didn't go to his brother Abel. But I can tell you there was something in the background here that maybe was working in Cain's life that he should have forsaken. And let me tell you this, too, that there are principles of growth that we use to grow and that are, that are good and they're, 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 again, applaudable. And we look at that and we say, hey, that's, that's a good principle of growth and, and those are areas you should grow. But, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're societal growth goals. Does that make sense? They're, they're societal growth goals. And there is a big difference between trying to please society and trying to please our Savior. There is a difference than saying, hey, I want to amass this amount of wealth. So society looks at me and says, now that's a guy who has a few bucks. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a few bucks. There's nothing with wrong with having a few million bucks. But not if you're out there to compete with someone else. If it's not what God wants, then it's not what God wants. Why would, you, why would we not want to be in line with, with what God has for our lives? Our growth strategy should focus on pleasing God. Our growth strategy should focus on pleasing God, not on getting the praise of others. Here's a couple areas we think about physical fitness. That's a good one. We think about, we talked about these three things, physical fitness, financial freedom, and educational enlightenment in the first lesson. All these three are really good in and of themselves. They're wonderful we, I think we ought to be attaining all of these things, but physical fitness for the wrong reason does not please God. Financial freedom for the wrong reason does not please God. Educational enlightenment for the wrong reason does not please God. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we please God in this, and what area does God want us to grow in this year? I could ask myself, does God want me to, to, to grow in education? Well, he does. He does. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of imbeciles. <laughs> he doesn't want people to look at the Christian and say, man, they don't know anything. But is it necessary to get a second doctorate? No, it's not. 
If you have a billion dollars, is it necessary to, to have another billion? Probably not. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we grow? How do we not fall into this temptation? Well, let me tell you a little bit about this temptation and by way of application, and let me give it to you, and this is what I call application 1.0. This is application 1.0. First of all, nobody likes being told that what they do isn't enough. I mean, is that not exactly what happened to Cain? His offering was not acceptable to God. How many of you enjoy being told that your effort was worthless? Raise your hand. See, nobody likes that. Nobody likes being told that, hey, listen, what you did just isn't good enough. And, you know, I think that a temptation that we fall into uh, is rooted in pride. That's P-R-I-D-E, pride. When our efforts are not good enough. And let let me say this, too, that even the notion of growth, has enough to kind of stir up a little hatred for people, (laughs) you know. You're telling me that I have to grow. Well, I mean, you're telling me that I'm not good enough. No, that's right. None of us are good enough. And that's why we grow. None of us are good enough. You you, you tell somebody who is complacent and proud that they need to grow, and you know what? The fists go up. Don't you tell me that I'm not good enough. I've been working really hard, and so did Cain, and I'm not saying he didn't. I'm saying Cain worked probably really hard. But was it the right effort for the right goal? And was it done in the right way? You see, growth is good, and you can put a million dollars in the bank, but if you steal it, you did it wrong. (laughs) Growth uh, in a physical fitness is good, but if you're injecting steroids into your leg, you're doing it wrong. We have to do what we need to do the right way, though, right? And this is rooted in pride. So we have to be careful not to fall into this temptation, the temptation of pride, that my effort, what are you talking about? My effort wasn't good enough. This is application 1.0. Application 2.0 is that maybe Cain wasn't upset because his sacrifice wasn't good enough, but maybe because his brother's sacrifice was. How many of us, have, uh, have a temptation rooted in envy, right? That maybe, that maybe it's not that, that I'm not good enough, the application 1.0, but it's that they are good enough. You know, I, I think about the, the, the deterioration of Christianity because they, they look on others. Now, this is different than covetousness. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school. And, and I'm telling you right off the bat, I'm guilty of it all. I'm guilty of the pride, of the envy, and of the covetousness. But let me just say this about envy and covetousness. They're different. Covetousness is wanting what someone else has. Envy is not wanting someone else to have what they have. I want to take it from them so they don't have it. It's not because I want it. And, you know, when I look at, when I look at the, uh, the sacrifice here that, that Abel offered, it was acceptable unto God. Now, it was, was, uh, was Cain... Was he toiling? Was he struggling? This temptation, was it, was it, was it pride that, that my effort wasn't good enough, that, that I should have been successful? Or, or was it that I'm so mad at my brother, I want what he has? Matter of fact, I don't want him to have it. This is a terrible temptation. This is a terrible temptation. And you know what? We are all susceptible to this. Anybody who says that, oh, I'm not susceptible to... to uh, to this pride or to this envy or to this covetousness is just flat out wrong. It's just true. We all have to be so careful of Cain's temptation because we're all susceptible to Cain's transgression. Cain's transgression. In Genesis 4.8, and Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And you say, Pastor Joe, like, I'm not going to go out and kill anybody. Okay. Have you torn someone down lately? Have you talked bad about somebody lately? Have you maybe have said something that wasn't becoming of a Christian? And, you know, the reality is, is we are all susceptible of tearing somebody down. Maybe not the physical act of murder. Years ago, when I got saved, I went to this church. It was called Evergreen Community Church. It was a, I, I thank God I'm saved. Let's put it that way. And, uh, but, man, when I went to this church, 
it just it just was uh, it was uh, more of an entertainment than anything. We were sitting in a in a, in a high school and and it was uh, a band basically. It was just it was, it was really just entertainment. Now the messages were good. And 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 I remember one of the first messages, the Bible messages I ever sat under in this church. You know what they said? They said you can kill somebody without murdering them. <sighs> what? And he says, have you ever murdered someone's character? Woof. Just like this wave of emotion, I thought, man. And that was like a long time. That was like 22 years ago. And I remembered that message. And when I see this, I ask myself, how many times have we torn someone down? How many times have we been negative in a situation where, where we aren't building people up in the most holy faith? We're not encouraging them. We're tearing them down. Now, this, was, uh, this has been probably uh, several, uh, last year or something, Josh, who was laying in bed with me, we were kind of cuddling, and, and he says to me, he says, why do we have to be so negative? And you all remember the story, and I don't see myself as like an overly negative person. But you know what that told me? I'm an overly negative person. <laughs> and it took my, at that time, I don't know, 12 or so your old boy, he, he says this to me, and it really just kind of knifed in my heart. I thought, man, at that time, we were going through a real tough situation, not with any of you, with, with another ministry, and, and I was just really heartbroken, and, and man, there was just a lot of emotion involved there, a lot of emotion. This is about a year and a half ago now at this point, and, and, and just a ton of emotion. Like, I can't even tell you how much emotion. Well, let me tell you, I remember standing in the lobby with my staff, my, 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 my staff would all, would all hear this. And I was so concerned that, that this other ministry was going to try to destroy this ministry because of me. I told, I told the ministry, I told the, the pastor, I said, I will leave the ministry before you destroy Northside Baptist Church. And I told my staff that. And I remember we were out there weeping, and we're crying, and we're praying. And it was like a horrible time in our life. Like, I'm going to leave the ministry because somebody is going to try to attack my church. I mean, I was just, I can't even tell you the amount of emotion. It was horrible. And so all this came home, and, and we would sit down, and we'd talk about it, 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 we'd talk about it. And then finally, my son says to me, why do we have to be so negative? Like, you know, children should be seen and not heard. No, I, I did not say that. I wanted to say that, though. And, but you know what? That really, that really impacted me. And I said, you know what? We are susceptible to the same transgression that Cain was. Now, we might not be out there with a knife killing somebody, but I tell you what, we better be careful of murder in someone's character. This is one thing that I'm really trying hard to do is get more encouraged, be more encouraging, be more supportive. When, when somebody gets around me, I want them to be like, man, that Pastor Joe, he just, I mean, I'm sure he's got an opinion, but he just doesn't matter. You know, he just loves God and loves people and, and isn't concerned. Listen to this, 1 John 3, 11 to 12. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, verse 12 is the connection between Cain and Abel. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now, to me, that just... Just because someone else's works are better than ours does not mean we should tear them down. You know, what's interesting is that oftentimes we tear people down because they do better than us, not because they do worse. Because of pride, because of envy, because of jealousy. How many times have we set goals because it pleases society as opposed to please our Savior? How many times have we said, this is what, 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 what I should have because this is what society wants? as opposed to saying, is this really what God wants? And can I encourage you this morning, church, that if you haven't prayed about that, like ask God, literally ask him and said, Lord, I want to I have a goal this year that's going to please you. How many of you have done that where you've said in your quiet time, in your quiet space, you've said, Lord, what area do you want me to grow in this year? as opposed to just kind of picking one of 10 areas. Uh, now, I want to grow in all areas, and that's true. But I can promise you that God has one specific area for you to grow in, probably more than the rest. And I think if we were to sit down and have this dialogue with our Lord and say, Lord, do, I want to be more of a humble person. Is that what you want for me? Do you want me to be more humble? Maybe, maybe God is, maybe it's, it's the issue of generosity. Maybe it's the issue of, of uh, 
gentleness. Maybe God wants you to be more gentle. Have you asked the Lord that and said, Lord, do I just need to be more gentle? Maybe it's, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's more resolved. What area in your life does God want you to work on? You know, growth is critical in our lives because growth is biblical. If it wasn't biblical, why preach on it? If it wasn't important, why would there be such an encouragement in the Scripture to grow to get better? If growth didn't matter, why does it talk about uh, being a good steward with your money? If growth doesn't matter, why would it talk about being a good steward of your body? If growth doesn't matter, why would, it, why would the Bible talk so much about being a good steward of your children and your spouse and your church and a steward of the government if growth didn't matter? Growth is critical because growth is biblical. Let me say this in conclusion. I think Jeb Blount says it best. He says, You're, you are not defined by what happens to you, but rather by how you deal with what happens to you. And you know, Cain had an opportunity here to please the Lord, to be successful on God's terms, to set goals, to be successful the way that God wanted him to be. And you know what? He didn't. Instead, he became a murderer, and he became an icon of what not to do. Don't become jealous because your jealousy can lead to a, tremendous, a tremendously greater sin. Many of you say, well, well my, I, I, I might at times be jealous, but, but, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of a sinner. Or maybe, maybe at times I might be envious or covetous, but I'm not that kind of a sinner. And friends, don't be tricked. Sin will take you where you don't want to go. And if we just say, well, you know what, I'm just a little proud and a little envious, but, but and I'm just going to go. The guy was talking with his brother out in the field. Didn't seem like a big deal. Don't you just kind of wonder how it all went down? Like, I don't know. You, I play this story in my head, and I'm like, what was it? Do you think he just, you know, came up behind him and just slit his throat and kicked him down or you think it was a, you know, you think it was a stranglehold? I mean, I mean, how did how did Cain ever think he was going to get here? Because he didn't think he was going to get there. Sin will take you where you where you don't want to go, and so we have to be very careful. So when we plan our success this year, when we plan to be successful, we plan to grow. We say, Lord, where do you want me to grow? Where do you want me to grow? Specifically, I know in all areas. How and where do you want me to grow? And we need to pray about that. And if you haven't prayed about that, we're going to pray about that in just a second because I want us all to ask God how he wants us to be successful this year. Don't come to God on your own terms. Don't come to God saying, Lord, I know the way that you want me to be. You say, Lord, I want to be the way you want me to be. And friends, if you're here today for the first time and you don't know where you're going when you die, that's the first question you ought to ask yourself. You ought to say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going when I'm die. I mean, I, I, maybe I'll go to heaven, maybe I'll go to hell, but there are really only two options. Either you're going to spend an eternity with the Lord or you're going to spend an eternity without the Lord. You know what's really neat is that the option is up to you. The Lord doesn't take matters into his own hands. He kind of says, the option's yours. I want this hand to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's spiritual separation from God. The wages of sin. Somebody, somebody has to die for this sin. The wages, the payment is somebody has to die. So either you die with this sin and you spend an eternity separated from God, or, or you allow someone else to make that payment for you. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth, was born, lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross to die there for your sin. Because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. The wages of sin isn't uh, being, a, being a good Baptist or being a good Catholic or, or maybe turning over a new leaf and, and doing all of the things. The, 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 the wages of sin is not, 
is, is, is not something that you can do. The wages of sin is death, and that's trusting that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was good enough for you. You see, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get to heaven. You've got to be perfect. And Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for our sin. And isn't that so nice that here you are with your sin and you trust that Jesus Christ made that payment for you? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's not because you're a good boy. It's not because you're a good girl. It's not because you, you give a good offering or you come to a good church. It's because we have a great God who died in our place That is a miracle. And we trust him by faith, and he saves us. He dies on the cross because the wages of sin is death, and he comes back to life, right? He raises from the grave. Because if he died and stayed there, he wouldn't be God because you can't kill God. So he had to come back to prove that he was God, right? And so his payment on the cross was sufficient for us. If you haven't trusted Christ today as your personal Savior, I'm asking that you do that. I'm asking that if we, when we bow our heads in just a moment, you would pray a simple prayer like, Lord, I don't know it all, but I pray this morning that you'd save my soul. I'm trusting you as my personal Savior.